We are in a series this week. We are in the Nehemiah series. It's our third week. And so uh, turn with me to your, in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. You guys bring your Bibles here this morning? I mean, I don't know about you. I get excited about the Word of God, and He wants to reveal more and more of Himself through His Word. This is a gift that we have. And so I, I love it that we're in this series because we get to do a Bible study together, and uh, God's revealing some stuff. I've been loving the feedback. Uh, we're doing connect groups. Uh, we're studying the Word together, and God is speaking. And so it's been great to hear things that are being shared, and uh, not just what's happening on a Sunday morning, but what God is doing throughout the week. And so, Nehemiah chapter 2, go there with me. Thank you, Tommy. Give you a little recap of the last few weeks, if you're just joining with us, or if you just need a recap. Uh, We have been looking at the book of Nehemiah. We've been looking at what God is doing, uh, understanding that Nehemiah is one of these final things that God is doing in the Old Testament before Jesus comes. Even though it sits in the middle of your Old Testament chronologically, it's one of these final things that he's establishing. The, the, The people of God, the children of Israel, have been in exile for 70 years. They've been overtaken by Babylon and now Persia is the big player now, and this is something that they were removed from the promised land. It's something that was self-inflicted. It's something that they brought upon themselves. God was trying to speak to them over and over and over again, and they didn't listen, and so they got they got uh, taken out of the land, um, but God raised up a reformer named Nehemiah. How many know that we need revival in this place, but we also need reformation? Okay, God wants to bring the two together, okay? Revival is great, a sweeping revival, but we need lasting change. Nehemiah is a reformer, and he is raised up. God puts a burden on his heart, and he starts bringing the, he brings the third and and final wave of the exiles back to Israel because Israel's in trouble. Jerusalem's in trouble. It's in shambles, and the walls are broken down, and God raises him up, and he is going to do this great work to rebuild the walls. There's two things that we can see in this book. Number one is if you're in a place of brokenness, if you're in a place of disrepair, maybe it's something that has happened to you. Maybe it's something that's, that you've brought upon yourself. We can take heart because despite that, God is working a redemptive plan in your life. You probably don't even feel like you deserve it. We don't deserve it. But what Jesus did on the cross is for everyone, and he's working a redemptive plan in your heart, and he's doing that right now. He's doing it behind the scenes. And number two, as we look at God's story in the Old Testament, and we can say, you know what? Because God is faithful to his covenant people, he will be faithful to me. We have a God that keeps his promises. When you read through his his faithfulness to his covenant people, Israel, then we can read the New Testament promises and say, God is a God who keeps his promises. He's doing this work. And so your faith can be stirred up as we read through this narrative. Now, uh, the first week we looked at kind of just a a macro view, a a 30,000 foot view of of this whole story that God is doing and and just through the Old Testament. And last week we looked more of like a zoomed in view of Nehemiah himself and how he was a cupbearer to the king. He is in a place of prestige. He's he's, He's doing well for himself compared to all the other captives in Israel. He is the king's confidant and he is a career man that has uh, pe- uh, uh, excuse me, he has uh, carved a path. All right, pray for me this morning as I get the words out. He has carved a path, and uh, God puts it on his heart, a burden on his heart for the people of Israel. And just looking at it, he sacrificially lays it all on the line, everything that he had. He also sacrificially lays his life on the line as he comes to the king, and now he's stepping out. In, in chapter 1, we see the passion of Nehemiah, and in chapter 2, we see the compassion of Nehemiah, the passion in action. Okay, it's great to have passion. Passion is necessary, but if it doesn't move us to action, then it's just hype. Okay, I've, 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 I've compared it to passion is like pressing on the accelerator, 
okay? But compassion is throwing it in gear. Jesus was moved with compassion to minister to the people. Okay, there's a lot of revving engines out in the world right now. There's a lot of, of people pressing on the accelerator. If you're on, in, on social media, if you're just looking, you see there's a lot of outrage culture out there. But what God is trying to raise up is someone that will actually step out and, and, and do it. We see Nehemiah stepping out in this. And so we come all the way to chapter 2. He has stepped out, and I want to read here in verse 11 of chapter 2. If you're with me, holler at me. Got it up on the screen. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate towards the jackal wall and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and reentered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because I had yet because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in Jerusalem lies in ruin and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. <coughs> so they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Heronite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Gresham the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. Excuse me. <coughs> they asked, are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Let's pray after I take a drink. God, we ask for your word to speak to us this morning. I pray for every single one of us, Lord. Let our hearts be open. God, as we open up the word and, and we read it, God, I pray, Lord, that you would, your Holy Spirit would begin to transform. Seeds would be sown in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, stir up your church to action. God, we give you a, a, a moment here to, to, to wait on you. Lord, would you begin to stir us up in our faith. Stir us up, Lord, in action. Lord, as we look at the testimony of Nehemiah, God, we are stirred up. We, all, we pray this, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, turn to your neighbor this morning and say boldly, I'm stepping out. If you're sitting by yourself, tell yourself, I'm stepping out. I'm stepping out. Come on, we're stepping out, church. It's time to step out. I really believe as we look at 2020, which is cool to say, by the way, way cooler than 2019, 2020. God's doing some cool things in 2020. He's preparing us. We've been praying. We've been seeking the Lord. 21 days of prayer and fasting. In that, God is speaking. You know, when you seek the Lord, when you humble yourself and pray, the word of God says that he will answer. He will meet you. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. And so God is speaking. If you haven't felt that breakthrough yet, it's coming. If you've sown into that, if you've, if you've been praying and fasting, it's coming. And I know just in my own personal life when I've prayed and I've fasted, sometimes it doesn't come right away, but the breakthrough is coming. And so we're stirring. And some words that God has spoken to us for this year is stepping out. It's establishing and it's taking ground. God wants to move. He wants his church to step out. And you know that God is doing a work when you start feeling just a wrestle in your spirit. Uh, I call it a holy dissatisfaction. 
There's something, something's going on. Some of us are stuck, and God will, will start to disturb you in your place. You're like, you know, I don't feel comfortable anymore. He wants to move you. Some of us are seeking the Lord. We've been faithful to our post, and God's saying, you know what? It's time to step out. It's time to go out in a boldness. Nehemiah experiences a wrestle in his spirit. He experiences just this stirring in chapter 1 when he inquires about Jerusalem. What's going on in Jerusalem? We know compassion starts with asking a question. What's going on in my culture? What's going on in my city? What's going on in my school? I want to know. I don't want to just be in ignorance anymore. I want to know. But as you ask that, God will start to put a burden on you and say, I'm glad you asked because I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for a young man, a young woman. I'm looking for a a middle-aged, any generation to stir up and to start asking a question. And then he'll start to put a seed in you, a word, and he puts a burden on Nehemiah. And Nehemiah gets stirred into this place. He, he, he gets stirred up and he takes, this, he takes this bold step of faith and he steps out. Steps out. God's calling us to take a bold step of faith and step out. I believe that's very personal, but it's corporate as well. That God's got something on your life. God's got something that as you seek him, he's saying, okay, I'm calling you to step out. Step out in faith. Believe that Bellingham is going to be blessed when my church steps out more. Come on, we're not here just to play church. That's totally boring. You know, it's, it's just, we don't got time for that. We're here because God has put a call on us because we, we believe in a God that changes things. We believe that Jesus needs to be magnified in every area and every sphere of influence on the campus, in schools, and in our city. We believe that God wants to transform Bellingham, and so we want to step out. I want to look at this morning three areas that we see Nehemiah stepping out in. You guys Ready? You guys taking notes, you know, just faithfully taking notes. I like to take notes because for some reason if I take notes, I feel like I remember them and I retain them. I don't even sometimes look back at them, but it just, it's just how I learn. So if you're taking notes, we're going to look at three things. Number one, Nehemiah steps out unto the battlefield. When he takes that bold step of faith, he steps out unto the battlefield. We know that because he is met immediately with opposition. Not eventually, immediately. When God puts something on your heart and you say, you know, I'm going to step out, you need to expect that the enemy is going to oppose you. You need to count on it. You need, you need, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You need to say, I, I understand that I'm stepping out, I'm going to step on some toes. Because we're going to read a little bit more that it's about territory. It's about taking ground. And that ground is occupied at the moment. So God's stirring you up, and he's saying, take a step out. And when you step out, you're stepping out onto the battlefield. Nehemiah 2.10, it says, When Sanballat the Heronite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, this is backing up just a little bit, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And then in 19 again, But when Sanballat the Heronite and Tobiah the Ammonite official of and Gresham the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. As he steps out, as he, as he moves forward, you know, I, I thought that he had, had, had jumped a pretty high hurdle when he got favor from the king and he kind of laid his career and he laid his life on the line. I thought, man, that, that's, this was it, you know. But he steps out and immediately there's a few other characters on the scene. Sam Ballot is, is, is this character. He's like a bad cold. He's not going to go away very soon. We're going to see him through the book. His name in Babylonian literally means sin gives life. There's your first clue. This guy's bad news. Okay, he, he, he is dead set on opposing the work of God that he is doing. We know just a little bit as we read on that, that Sam Ballot is, is he's, he's, a, he's a governor a regional governor in the area. He's got his little micro kingdom that he has, and he is benefiting off the brokenness of Israel. So God comes and brings a restorative work. He brings a move, and this is threatening to someone who is benefiting off the brokenness of Israel. You know, the enemy benefits off the brokenness in our life. God wants to bring a restorative work. God wants to set the captives free. The enemy wants to keep us in captivity. 
And so there's this cosmic clash that takes place. And we know in Ephesians 6, 12 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's important. Because you're not going to get very far wrestling people and fighting with people. But you do need to understand that there's a spirit realm and that the spirit works through people. That the spirit realm works through people. So we don't be deceived that there's no such thing as serving yourself. You're either serving God's purposes or you are vulnerable to being a pawn on the enemy's chessboard. Okay, you, we, need, we need to understand who we're serving. And I'll just be, I'll just be honest. You know, you may not think about it this way, but we've all been used by the enemy. We've all been a sucker before. Okay, I have for sure. I have agreed with the accuser and not the advocate in my life and in other people's lives at times. If you're understanding and you're, in, in you're understanding how that works and how the enemy uses it, we see just Jesus with his disciples and the enemy tries to find a doorway in and, and, and he uses Peter and Peter's starting to discourage him from going to the cross and Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. Okay, that was awkward probably for Peter. But the enemy's looking for a vessel. He finds a vessel in Sanballat. He's using self-interest. He's using the, uh, his, his corruption to come against Nehemiah. Last year we were, um, you know, we had carried the love. This is the third year we've had carried the love. And, and last year uh, we just had this vision of, of getting on campus and preaching the gospel. And Mariah had a vision of the field just, you know, preaching the gospel and and, uh, you know, we're like, this year we're going to get on campus. We're going to do that. It's going to be powerful because we just believe that's so significant. And we had it all lined up, and everything was looking great. And about the week before, things fell through, and we didn't get on campus, and it was discouraging. And it was just kind of like, what? We, I feel like God spoke to us, and uh, we had to have an alternate uh, venue, and uh, just after discussing and kind of praying, it kind of dawned on us, it dawned on me, and maybe I was a little bit slow, but it's like, well, we shouldn't be surprised that the enemy wouldn't just uh, let us waltz up to the campus and have a meeting. There's going to be resistance, but that's okay, because we're going to keep going on, we're going to keep persevering, and now we can testify and say, you know, we got on campus, we put a flag in the ground, and we're going to keep taking ground. But when you step out in faith and you step out in what God's called you to do, you better expect resistance because you're stepping on a battlefield. You're stepping on an area that, that, that the, the enemy has occupied and God's given us the authority. And the truth is, it's an unfair fight. Okay, we have the power. We, it says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have the power. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that Jesus has given you the authority? It, there's a few people, but I believe there's more that believe that Jesus has given them the authority. We need to own this and understand that. But how you, how you win in an unfair fight, let me tell you how you win in an unfair fight. Give you a little, little hint. When I, was, when I was in high school, got my license, and, and my cousin, who was about the same age as me, he got his license, and, and we were friends, but we were kind of competitive, you know. I don't know if you had that dynamic with your brother or your, your cousin or your sister or whatever, competitive. And his dad gave him a 1972 Chevelle. Okay, this is like the, the awesome car, muscle car. It was a, a 350 big block, if you know what that is, with a carburetor just guzzling fuel. It got like eight miles to the gallon, horse, oozing horsepower. And it had the, the, the manifolds and the dual exhausts. Does anyone in here, you love the dual exhaust, okay? There's nothing like, I mean, Tesla, I love that they're doing all this stuff, but there's nothing like American muscle. I want to get one of these cars. And my dad gave me... <clears throat> A, I inherited this old Nissan two-wheel drive pickup that had no horsepower. It was very small, and it zipped around. I was thankful, but I wasn't very fast, okay? And, uh, of course, we're competitive, and, you know, I cannot beat my cousin, you know, in his Chevelle. And so, um, you know, I'd see him around town because we live in Oak Harbor. It was a small town. You'd see it was this gold Chevelle, and you'd see it just roaring around and stuff. And so uh, this one time I see him, he pulls up to the stoplight, and he doesn't see me. And, and it's one of those stoplights that has a two-lane stoplight, and then like a couple hundred feet after the stoplight, it goes into a one-lane. Do you know those stoplights? 
And if you're on the line, you better, you better get ahead and get ahead of the traffic. And so I, I'm like, there he is. He's there. He doesn't see me. I pull up, and I pull up, and I'm going to give you some wisdom here this morning. I pull up right in his blind spot. Okay, just right there in the corner. He has no idea. I see him eating cheeseburgers, just picking his nose. He has no idea. And I'm like, I'm going to get him right off the line. Sure enough, it turns green. I'm going by. I'm in front. I'm beating him. It's an unfair fight. And I want to tell you, this is my point that I'm trying to make here this morning. The enemy, he benefits off the blind spots of the church. He benefits off the blind spots of the believer. He lingers in the blind spot. And he knows he can't beat you. He knows he doesn't have the authority. He knows it's an unfair fight. But if he can lull you to sleep, and if he can hang out in the blind spot, he'll take you every time. That's why God says, I'm waking up my church. I'm understanding that they know the weapons of their warfare. And that you actually can understand the authority that you have, the dunamis power the Holy Spirit gives you. But we also need one another in the blind spots as well. We need accountability. We need, we need to, to be together to win at this battle. And so we get up on campus, you know, or we don't get on, on campus, and, and, you know, we're experiencing resistance. And I remember when we uh, first moved into town, we took a big step. We moved into town years ago, um, and uh, re- David had rented out the, the Cornwall parking or, or the Cornwall shopping area there with a the big parking lot and all that stuff, and we set up shop. And, you know, the residents there, they, they were not happy that a church had moved in. And uh, I remember just pulling up, and we were getting gear in there and stuff, and they were saying mean things to us, and they were just like, I remember one guy said, "Uh, for God's sakes, all we need is another church here. And uh, my feelings were hurt, and and I was like, oh, my goodness, like, there's just not a welcome, you know, um, spirit. And I was thinking, well, I do agree with that. For God's sake, we do need another church. I can agree with that, but I felt like there was some sarcasm in there. And, and it was like, wow, there's resistance. And I love this verse in 1 Peter 4.12. It says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You ever know that you step out and you're like, something strange is happening here. We're not getting on campus. P- people are, are making fun of me. We're getting persecution. The Bible says, hey, wake up. Don't be surprised. It's the enemy. He's coming against you. But take hope. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. When you step out, church, when we step out this year, when you step out when God has you, expect the opposition, but understand your authority in God. Amen? Matthew 16, 18. This is where we get our church name. It says, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail upon this rock. And so Jesus prophesies that he's building something. And he also indicates that the gates of hell are not going to prevail, but there's going to be a resistance. There's going to be an attempt, but they will not prevail. And here, just the actual Greek translation is Pile, Hades, Kataskio. Jesus says the barrier of the grave will not be strong enough to overcome you is a a more accurate translation. Isn't that incredible? So God's calling you to step out. He's he's calling you to take authority, and then he's prophesying, he's saying, the barrier of the grave isn't strong enough for you if I'm in you. Come on, can you get excited about that this morning? I I feel like there's some, some addictions because addictions that you've had for years, they can be the most discouraging thing. That's a barrier of the grave. That's not strong enough for the spirit of God that's going to rise up inside of you. So we're stepping out onto the battlefield, and we're knowing our weapons of our warfare. We're knowing our authority. And number two, Nehemiah steps out in humility. He steps out in humility. He steps out in opposition in the battlefield, and then he steps out in humility. You know, the, when, when God puts something on your heart and when God stirs up a work in you, it can be exciting. It can be grand. It can be awesome. It's like, Lord, you want me to do that? And wow. And if you're not careful, your identity will start to attach to that thing. And you can start drawing your significance to that thing because what God is doing is awesome. 
But Nehemiah stewards what God has put in his heart, and he stewards it in a spirit of humility. And I want to read here, if you want to read together with me, Nehemiah 2.12. It says, I set out during the night with a few others. And he says this not once, but he says twice. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. And then fast forward to 16, it says, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because I, as yet I had said nothing to the Jews. Twice in one chapter, he's, 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 it's this autobiography that he's, he's given this account. He's saying, I didn't tell anybody. I, I didn't go promoting it. Now, Nehemiah comes into town, into Jerusalem. He's a high-ranking official to King Artaxerxes. He's coming in with resource. He's coming in, we, we, we know in chapter 1, he's coming in with a cavalry, a small army. He's coming in with a seal of the king. He's coming with with authority. Okay, he is coming, and he's making a grand entrance whether he likes it or not. We know he's turning some heads in Jerusalem. They're, they've been in shambles, and they're like, what has just got Nehemiah? I, I heard that he's a, he's, he's a Jew, and he's coming, and what's going on? And I'm, the questions were going, the speculation, everything. And Nehemiah says, I'm not telling any, anyone what's going on. I, I, I'm not telling anybody what's going on yet. And it says that he goes out at night and he's surveying. He doesn't tell the officials that he's with him. He's walking in this humility. And I, and I um, can't help but think about Mary and Joseph. And I don't mean uh, Joseph, uh, who was Mary's husband, but Joseph, the man with the coat of many colors. Mary gets this incredible word from God. Gabriel. Okay, one of the archangels shows up to her house and says, you are going to conceive the Messiah. And it says that Mary treasured and hid these things in her heart. Okay, if, if Mary had a, a social media account or a Twitter or a Facebook or whatever, it doesn't say that she went straight to her social media account and told everybody. I mean, not that I'm saying that people are doing that these days. I think everyone's staying humble, right? But she didn't, she treasured these things in her heart. And I just want to challenge us as God begins to speak to us and he, get, he begins to, 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 to give us calls and he begins to do that. Some of those things are precious to God and they're, they're to treasure in your heart. You don't need to go blurt them out. But, but we look at Joseph and, and Joseph gets a call. He, he has these dreams and right away he starts bragging to his brothers. And that didn't turn out too well for him. Even his dad says, hey, jo- Joseph, can you knock that off? Okay, he, he, he's walking in that. And I really believe that, that God's stirring some things in us. He's calling us some things. But, you know, we need to know when to boldly proclaim it and when to hide it in our hearts. When to say it out loud. When to keep it to ourselves. You know, humility knows how to discern the difference. So we walk in humility and we say, you know what? There, there's, there's a time that God wants to bring this to fruition. But maybe now is not the time. I'm seeking him. I'm walking in humility. The other day I was, I was talking about um, just a uh, testimony and everything, and, and even about our church, and I used the phrase, humble beginnings. I was like, yeah, you know, it was humble beginnings and everything. And, and I, used it, I used it twice in a week. And, and I, I was like, all of a sudden I felt the Holy Spirit kind of just rebuking me and convicting me. And you ever felt that? It's just like, what are you, what are you saying here? And, and so I, um, you know, when the rebuke of the Holy Spirit comes, it's so great, it's so awesome. Because it's, it's going to be a change. It's going to be something that you want. And so I asked the Holy Spirit, and the conversation kind of went like this. You guys want to hear the conversation. This is how it went. He said, you're using the phrase humble beginnings like you've moved away from humility somehow. And, and the conviction that I felt in my heart is that humility is not a stage in life. But in the kingdom, it's a way of life. You, you start in humility you stay in humility, and you end in humility. And I am going to make a point not to use that, that phrasing anymore. I was like, Lord, uh, uh, let me stay humble. Lord, let me not indicate any way that we've moved past humble beginnings. We are humble, okay? This is, when you hang out with Jesus, when you are pursuing him, his nature starts to rub off on you, and that is humility and serving. And when you step away from humility, you start to enter into pride, and when you start to enter into pride, you begin to light up on the enemy's radar. And if you didn't know that, that's kind of a scary thing right there. It's like you're just like, boop, boop. The enemy's like, that's pride. That, that is my wheelhouse. I can work through that. 
and you give him a doorway. No, Nehemiah is not giving the enemy a foothold. He's walking in humility. And, and as God begins to breathe on his ministry, gives him favor, we see him leading humbly. Church, we're going to take this city. We're going to see wonderful things happen. I do believe that we are going to see a move of God in our generation. We're going to see a new Jesus movement take place. We are counting on it. We are contending for it, but we're going to stay in humility. It doesn't matter what God does here. We're saying it's all for Jesus. Okay, get us out of the way. Get us out of the way. Number three. So no, number two is he steps out in humility. And number three, he steps out in the authority of the truth. Okay, although he's a humble leader, although he's, 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 he's not telling anyone he's doing, he's got this secret life, he's got this private life between him and God, he is bold in the truth. He is bold in what God has put on him. You know, when you're representing God's vision, you need to make no apology for your boldness in declaring it. You can put your full weight behind that because it's what God is doing. And here in Nehemiah 2.19, we see Sam Ballot comes on the scene. And he says, what is it that you're doing? They ask, are you rebelling against the king? Now, Nehemiah asks him a question. But this question really isn't uh, an inquisitive question. This is an accusation. This is a trap. And what we know about Nehemiah, I'm thinking this may have struck a nerve with Nehemiah. This, this may have hit Nehemiah um, it just, just right at that button. Because Nehemiah, you need to remember, he's cupbearer to the king. He is loyal to the king. He is full of integrity. He didn't get that position by not being a man of honesty and integrity. And so the enemy comes and tries to strike him right there in that nerve, and Nehemiah doesn't take the bait. You know, the enemy comes, and he knows where to hit us. He knows the lies to say. He knows, knows the buttons to push. But Nehemiah doesn't take the bait, because Nehemiah knows that when you argue with a fool, you are reduced to their folly. And when you argue with the enemy, when you get down and you and you, and you step into that temptation and, and that argument, that foolish argument. You go get into the arena with the enemy, and God's not calling us to be there. Another translation says, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you'll become as foolish as they are. He doesn't answer the enemy's foolish argument. He declares boldly the truth to the enemy. Really believe that the word this morning is that God wants you to start stop arguing with the enemy's foolish arguments and start declaring the truth over your life with boldness. There are futile arguments taking place. There's a lot of arguing going on in our culture right now. Don't take the bait. Don't get into it. Don't, don't, don't enter into that. Just boldly declare the truth of what God has called you to do. The enemy comes in. We see that in the example of Jesus that, you know, the Pharisees tried to trip him up all the time, and they would ask him a question. They'd lay a trap for him, and he would never walk into it. He would always respond to them with his own question. He would always respond to them with the truth of the word. And I want to close here this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. But I want to end on verse 20, where Nehemiah boldly responds and boldly declares it says, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. I want us to just stand up as we close this morning. Really believe for, for, for us as a church God wants us to stop arguing and start declaring. As you step out, there's going to be some opposition. There's going to be some arguments that come against you. Don't, don't argue. Start declaring. What is the truth? The truth is, enemy, you have no share in the ground that God has given me. That's right. You have no stake here. 
As we step out into Bellingham, as we step out onto campuses, as we step out into neighborhoods, we can declare, enemy, you have no share here. You have no stake here. Jesus paid for this. Do you know that when we get on to, to, to see home campus, when we get on to different areas, we're not in enemy territory. That's right. Come on. We're in the territory of the kingdom. Jesus paid for that. Yep. Amen. We're reclaiming what Jesus paid for. That's good. Nehemiah had the, the letters of the king. He had authority to do that. It was a type and a shadow of Jesus giving us the authority. So you don't come in timidly. You come in boldly and you boldly declare Enemy, you have no stake here. Unbelief, you have no share in this land. Come on. Depression, you have no share in this place. Addiction, you have no share. Come on, let's declare it out. Who doesn't have a share in your year? You're going to take ground. Fear, you have no share. You have no ground. Come on, we're going to rebuild. We're going to go out in the power of our God, and we're going to see the purposes of God fulfilled in our life, in this city, in this church. I want to declare that. Let's pray. God, we just lift up the name of Jesus. I really feel that the Lord is calling you to take a step out. He's calling you to take some ground. And I want you to declare, just as a church, we're going to do a little, just a little declaration here. Just personally, you declare to that thing that has no share in your life anymore. You declare it. I'll declare personally. Fear, you've got no share in what God's building here. Come on. Stop arguing. Start declaring. Low self-esteem. You've got no share. Trauma, you've got no share. Hey, my past has no share in what God is doing. Come on, let's stir it up, church. We're gonna we're gonna end here just in worship. But you know, we've we've set our face to prayer and fasting. We we've we've been seeking the Lord and God wants to bring us forward. And so we're saying, you know what, this year we're taking ground, we're establishing, we're rebuilding, we're going out. We're taking a big step of faith out. And Lord, we just commit that to you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Stepping out onto the battlefield. We're stepping out in the humility of the Lord. And we're stepping out, God, in the boldness of your truth.